Lovely. Very good evening. And once again, welcome to an amazing session. Uh, I am recording this session. So if you choose to not be recorded, feel free to turn off your video and keep yourself muted, though we would love for all the engagement and interaction. So we would love for you to be on video and engage with us. Uh, uh, the presenter has requested that the questions be taken at the end. To minimize disruption, I will be muting all of you except for the uh, co-hosts and the presenters. So you'll all be mute. Please keep a note of all your questions. We have enough time towards the end to answer all your questions. With that, uh, I'm going to jump right into introducing the session. Uh, today, we gather to discover the power of self-knowledge in coaching. Uh, in coaching effectiveness based on Vedanta, keeping in mind the ICF core competency of embodies a coaching mindset. And that's the part that really intrigued me. So let's see how Ranga is able to connect all of this to embodies a coaching mindset. Uh, this is an immersive session, underscores a direct correlation between a coach's heightened self-awareness through the knowledge of Vedanta and their capability to catalyze transformative change in their clients. We will dive into depths of our scriptures to find the nuanced answers to eternal questions about human emotions, mind, relationships, dharma, karma, and so on. Uh, work on the inner self so that you may offer a space that facilitates growth for your clients. And to take us through this amazing experience, we've got an expert facilitator who's a coach. He's a trainer who combines decades of knowledge and practical application of our ancient wisdom. Please welcome joyful ranga as he chooses to call himself and we would love to continue to call him joyful ranga yeah. uh, ranga was fortunate to do his uh, two post graduations in the premier institutes iim and iit yeah uh, the two institutes gave him the attitude to question anything and everything although he was born in a very pious family he was more uh, more of a happy go lucky person and not much of a focus or interest in spirituality. Very hard to believe. I'm reading it out. And as I'm reading it out, I'm reading it out in disbelief. Primarily because he didn't find the logical intellectual answers to his queries. On the professional side, he's a high-end, high-valued leadership coach and trainer to various corporate houses. He's also the visiting faculty at ISB Hyderabad. Uh, he is renowned keynote speaker and multiple uh, mm -hmm. corporate events and uh, on leadership and transformation. His life transformed when he first attended a series of lecture on Vedanta in Rishikesh by Puji Swami Dayanand Saraswati. For the first time, he found brilliant answers to his queries and there was no looking back since then. He visits uh, such lectures. Uh, it has become an annual affair for him and he continues to do that. Combined with exploration in the Himalayas year after year and he's been doing that for the last 14 years. He started his journey into teaching the vast knowledge hidden in Vedanta in 2018 by the instructions of his Guruji. And he sure has found his calling. On the social space, he runs an NGO mm -hmm. uh, along with his wife, Meena. It is called Inside Out Foundation based in Bangalore and provides educational support to the needy children. He also is the chairman for an NGO based in Chennai that operates in the domain of child adoption, destitute women, rehabilitation, old age homes and drug addiction centers. We are simply honored and thrilled to have you with us, Ranga. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, pronounce to pronounce to each of you. I, I hope I'm audible. Uh, let me uh, let me welcome each one of you to this uh, immersive session. This is a five six hour content. I'm desperately trying to package into uh, an hour. Uh, of course, I have made an open offer uh, to Ishanti that, you know, if uh, the audience is keen and interested in uh, any number of interaction, I am I'm open to having. Uh, so with this, uh, I'm going to uh, run this session through a small presentation. Uh, so please give me just a moment to share the presentation. Many thanks to each of you for waiting. Uh, I would like to start my session with my deep gratitude to my gurus. I am what I am thanks to their unconditional and 
compassionate teaching. My pronouns, my gratitude. I've titled this uh, session as the power of self-knowledge in coaching effectiveness. Okay. First of all, when this request came to me, I was really, really thrilled and I felt very honored because I have huge respect for ICF as an organization. And when I got an opportunity now to interact with people who are known experts in the field of coaching and mentoring, uh, I, was, I was really very, very joyous and delighted. Now, I am not getting into the domain of coaching or mentoring itself uh, because I know uh, I'm dealing with experts here. What I intend doing is how my life transformed as a life coach with the kind of knowledge that was hidden and that got exposed to me. It is more an inward journey that I went into. And my idea of spending time with you is not to teach at all. It is only to share some experience and some perspectives that I have gathered over the years. Right? There is a question and answer session at the end. Uh, I am definitely not committing that I have all the answers, but I would love to listen to your questions and, and be sure if I don't know, I will simply say I don't know. Uh, I think that's an easier answer and a very honest and authentic answer to give. As Taitriya Upanishad says, Swadhyaya Pravachana Vyamna Pramatitavyam. I think all of us are teachers and students at the same time, as Richard Buck says in his book, Illusions 2, right? Let's not neglect study and teaching. I think we it, it's, it's a lifelong journey. And uh, the more I learned uh, Vedanta, the more I uh, learned scriptures, I realized how ignorant and what a long journey I have ahead of me. Right. So uh, it is with this little note that I would request you to uh, keep an open mind and listen to me. Uh, you do not have to accept it just perspectives that I'm sharing with you, what I've gathered over the years. There are many words that are used in the context of the field in which you and I are. Coaching, training teaching, counseling, guiding, mentoring. I've consciously put those bubbles in, you know, uh, as unstructured way as possible uh, so that there is no hierarchy to these words and there is no relative importance to any of these words. What I have found in my life coaching experience is although each of these words have specific meanings that the other words don't have, but when we actually interact with a person who is needing some kind of a support, if I may use that word, all these things kind of get, you know, smudged. It's, the, the lines are not that easy to draw. For example, when a student comes for some, say, career counseling, even though we call it career counseling, uh, suddenly the discussion shifts to uh, the life. Uh, although we get into, say, professional coaching, like an executive coaching, we are sitting on a table with, with say, a CEO of an organization, uh, and uh, the purpose of the coaching is to to talk about how he or she has to scale the company, but suddenly you realize that um, the, the zone of discussion shifts to uh, some aspects of personal life. So I would be sharing examples, not necessarily directly only with coaching. A uh, whole lot of examples could also be in uh, you know uh, life uh, counseling related domains because the lines are very hazy to draw around these words, right? <laughs> Although each of these words has very specific meanings, right? Some of uh, the areas of self-knowledge that has impacted me a lot in my life coaching journey. I've just listed a few of them here. One is, it was a great learning to me that temperaments are very different from mindsets. And what was affecting my coaching style and my coaching effectiveness more was my temperaments of which I was not aware of. And they were coming from a much deeper level of consciousness. right? And that was kind of slipping into the ideas I was suggesting or the questions that I was asking 
right? Because I've learned very clearly, like exactly how the, uh, you know, we, you, you all talk about it, ICF, that you don't give solutions to people, you only ask questions, right? You ask a series of questions and help the individual uh, reach where you want that person to reach or the person to introspect and help a person find oneself. I suddenly realized that many of those questions which I'm asking them, I also need to ask myself because the journey has to start from inside, right? Uh, so temperaments, I need to understand about myself. This is the first learning I had. Second, there was an over-identification which with, with the person sitting on the other side, uh, the person you may call him or her as coachy, a mentee, or just a person needing some kind of a help or a perspective, whatever term we want to give to that person. Uh, this over identification, I, I read a very uh, you know powerful uh, story, you know, very small story. Uh, this happens in London. A judge uh, takes a train to go from one city to another city to uh, you know take a case. Uh, and the journey is around five six hours, and he enters a train and sits down. After some time, an individual enters and sits across. Uh, after another 15 minutes, a few more people, uh, you know, a couple of more people come and sit across. Um, then slowly they start picking a conversation and the person says, we have to spend five, six hours together. Uh, um, so why don't we spend some time? And then they search around, they find uh, under the train seat, uh, a pack of uh, playing cards. Uh, so it was an accidental discovery. So they start uh, playing poker. Initially, the judge uh, wins some money and then subsequently he starts losing. And in his effort to get back the money that he lost, he ends up losing heavily. And after five, six hours, the station where he has to get down comes down. So he says bye to the people and he leaves. So the judge uh, sleeps for the night in a, in a guest house. And then next day morning, he appears in the court to take the case. Surprisingly, the case, the attorney informs that the case is about what the a wealthy person has charged against three people. And the case was the wealthy person was traveling in a train and uh, these three people uh, came in and sat as if accidentally. And they also accidentally found a pack of cards and they played poker and uh, the wealthy man was, uh, you know, removed of a whole lot of money in the game. And later the wealthy man realized that uh, it was all a game. Uh, and uh, these three people were partners in the crime and the, the playing card itself was a manipulated card pack. It was... Uh, placed deliberately under the seat so that they can accidentally discover. This was a case uh, and the judge has to give a pronouncement on that. Now, the, this is the same experience that the judge had just the previous evening. And the three people who are presented as, uh, you know, people who are uh, accused are precisely the same three people. Now, it's a classic case of the judgment or the objectivity of the judge will be crowded by his recent experience with the same three people and in an identical scenario, right? Now, many, many times when we are on the coaching side, uh, uh, I have placed, I have faced this problem of me identifying myself very closely with the other person that, you know, the issues are the same. Uh, and so uh, I will be tempted to guide the person in very similar ways as to how I handled it or how I missed to handle it, whichever way, right? Um, the second, uh, the, the next uh, issue that I've faced is an unresolved personal issues. Um, for example, if I'm going through something and, uh, and the other person comes to me for a guidance on something very similar, uh, then there is a deep guilt inside me or that, that kind of drives me to say, look, even I have not figured out an answer in my own life. Now, how do I guide you on this? Right. So there can be unresolved personal issues that can uh, truly affect the way I coach or, or mentor, right? I'm going to use these words interchangeably, even though each of these words have a lot of meaning. And uh, so please don't mind. Right? Then my belief sets can be very limiting. For example, uh, uh, I may not be a pretty ambitious person. And there is a person who is sitting uh, in front of me seeking some kind of a coaching saying that, look, uh, I, I want to build a, a $100 billion company in one year. Now, uh, my own belief sets may stop you know, and prevent me from thinking about solutions for the person because my, my beliefs will be the binding force by which I, I operate to that person. Uh, I may be a very strongly opinionated person on many aspects like, uh, say, a religion or a gender or a country or a geo or, you know, whatever. All those opinions will also come in the way. And of course, my own blind spots, right? Johari window blind spots uh, can affect. These are some of the blocks that I have found in my own coaching effectiveness. Um, although, uh, yeah, I did taste... Uh, a good deal of success like each of you in coaching, but 
I don't think uh, that the focus is not the success I, I enjoyed. The focus is more of what I missed in terms of the level to which I could have taken my coaching, which I missed because of lack of self-awareness and self-knowledge. Um, so it's my own experience, my own, uh, you know, uh, the power that I've discovered uh, uh, in terms of my uh, hits and misses, uh, which I'm presenting through this short session. Uh, this is a five, six hour content. Unfortunately, uh, I will have to package it. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can do the best justice to your time. Self-knowledge is knowledge of self. <laughs> it's not just active voice and passive voice like in English, you know. Um, self-knowledge is into two domains. Uh, primarily knowledge about our body and knowledge about our, uh, our mind. Uh, uh, a lot of body knowledge also is very important in coaching effectiveness, but I'm not going to focus on that today. Uh, I'm going to focus exclusively on uh, the mind aspect today uh, in this session. I just wanted to set the context Correctly. Uh, now, although there is a very well defined architecture of the body, like there's a plane of symmetry in one hand this side, one hand that side, and you know, uh, uh, one leg this side, one eye, one eye this side, that side, and all single parts are on the middle, and uh, with some exceptions like a heart being on only one side, there is a well defined architecture for the body. I realized through the scriptural learning that there is a well-defined architecture for the mind as well. And understanding my own mind is of paramount importance because that leads me to understand the other person's mind. I also realized that the whole concept of people management is a myth. We don't manage people at all. We only manage minds because the mind of the same person is very different at different points in time. And the coachee who comes for the first session has a different mind. The coachee who comes for the fifth session has a different mind. Right? So we end up dealing with the minds only. So it's more of mind management of my own mind and the other person's mind rather than managing people. Right? The mind of a child who's six years is very different from the mind of the same daughter of mine who's a teenager. Right? And is very different from the mind of the daughter, uh, you know, who's just got married. So the daughter is a daughter, the person is a person, but the mind is very different. So the way we deal with the mind. So we need to understand the architecture of the mind pretty, pretty correctly. And there is a very well defined architecture for the mind, although it is not directly seen. You can't touch it, but it's it's well defined. Uh, the mind is into layers. I don't want to get too deep into it because many of you are well aware of this. And so I could go a little faster here. The mind is structured in layers. And the outermost layer is the conscious mind. And the innermost layer is the unconscious mind. And somewhere in the middle is the subconscious mind. Uh, and I'm sure most of you might have read the beautiful book called The Power of the Subconscious Mind. And, uh, you know, how do you program it? And what happens when you build skills? You drive your car or you drive... Uh, you know, your skills are working at a subconscious level without your conscious mind and brain involved. Now, the, the understanding that I had uh, was 90% of our mind stores abstract feelings and a lot of judgments. Uh, data is relatively less in this zone. The data is converted to some kind of an experience and that experience as a feeling is what is stored, right? And mind is full of engrams. The engram is nothing but engraved memories, a combination of two words, engraved memories. And the mind is just full of engrams, right? Now, this, some part of this come to us when we're born. I'm not going to delve, delve into the too much of details into that. But some parts of it certainly comes to us when we're born. That's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, children of the same parents are very different. Uh, a child at the age of three or four, even though they, it can be part of the twins, uh, it's very different. The two twins are extremely different. Um, and you see uh, your, your group of kids playing in the park. Each person is very different. So yeah, there is a lot of things that come to us, uh, you know, when, when we're born. Uh, and a lot of it is conditioning that happens after we are born. 
conditioning by the family, conditioning by the society, conditioning by the school, conditioning by the political system, conditioning by neighborhood, society, friends, advertisements, social media, channels, right? Everything conditions our mind and each of these conditioning sits inside as just an engram, right? Somewhere. Uh, this is 90% occupancy of our mind. Only 10% uh, is a deliberate, uh, data-based, objective, uh, at that moment, where you don't confuse the past experience and you don't confuse the anxieties of the future. We are able to deal with that moment as that moment. Um, that part of the brain, that part of the mind, I don't want to use the word brain, that part of the mind is uh, just 10%, right? This, to me, was a great revelation because I had to delve a little deep into my own unconscious. And I was told very clearly that if you truly, truly, truly want to be a successful person, you have to conquer your unconscious, not your subconscious, unconscious. That's where a lot of things are sitting there and driving, and we are not even aware of it, right? So this is a beautiful architecture of the mind. If there is nothing that is tangible in the mind that we can see, we can touch, we can perceive using our five senses, then how are we sure that this is architecture? In such cases, what we normally do is we observe patterns. And by patterns, we observe that there is a logic behind it. There is a science behind it. Like I throw a ball and every time it falls down, I know that there is either a pushing force from top or a pulling force from below, even though that force itself is not seen uh, or smelt or you know heard. But I know that there is a force and I understand that force is force of gravity. So when we, when we observe patterns, and the patterns are very consistent. And when the consistent patterns, when we dig a little deeper, we understand certain principles, which are beyond the five senses perception, right? So this architecture of the mind is precisely uh, understood that way. Yeah. Now, I'm using a technical term here called vasanas. Uh, the English translation can be, even though I'm, I'm not very comfortable with the translation, some, some people call them impressions, imprints. Uh, which are coming across time. I don't want to use the word previous birth, next birth, then we get into a different discussion. But the fact is, there is a time scale. So what I gather as mindsets when I'm young from outside, it affects me when I'm old. So across time, so I was five years when I gathered the mindset, it is affecting me when I'm 50 years. So there is a time gap of 45 years that have happened. So similarly, I may gather something when I'm say 80, and I pass out at the age of 80, 85, maybe it will affect after another 40 years. So we are not dealing with one birth, two births. We are dealing with time. We are dealing with the continuum, continuum of time. And it does scary, right? So uh, I'm using the technical term here, asanas. So some people use the word samskaras, but I, I'm more comfortable with this imprints and uh, impressions, right? Now, what does this give us? It gives us two things. It gives us a very strong likes and dislikes. So at a very young age, there are children who like a blue color. There are children who like a green color. There are children who want to be outside. There are children who want to be inside. Um, so you have Gardner talking about multiple intelligence, right? Uh, so a whole lot of these senses have evolved from the fact that when we are born, we have three basic gunas or three basic uh, tendencies, if I may use the word, um, yeah, a very sober, sattvic, divinely kind of a guna called sattvic, then a highly passionate, highly energetic, uh, you know, action oriented, uh, impatient, results driven, uh, which we call rajas. And then we have a laid back, relax, enjoy life, it's all right kind of attitude, which is uh, more a tamas kind of a guna. Uh, so we have personalities which are around these three uh, combinations, different combinations of these. Uh, these come to us at the beginning, but they are not permanent. A lot of upbringing, a lot of conditioning could change that a lot, right? So what we are today may not be what we were born with. A lot of it can be due to what we have made ourselves to be as well, right? But I think it's important for us to know this, that there is a strong set of likes and dislikes that we are, we are born I am um, just setting the foundation for what self knowledge is all about and how it could affect us in 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 our in our coaching. Right? Another very very powerful knowledge that I gained during one of these sessions I, I attended in the Himalayas 
um, it was a session on understand yourself deeper, right? Uh, so I think uh, Google, if I remember right, I think uh, we, we we can check this out, okay? Um, they have a program called uh, Search Inside Yourself, S-A-Y, a kind of a program, right? So they are they are more uh, you know search kind of company. So they talked about search inside yourself kind of a program where they give a lot of lot of impact or uh, importance to knowing oneself first before understanding the other person, right? Um, so one of the biggest experiences I had was when I was in one of the uh, sessions on uh, you know self discovery, uh, and it was a very shocking revelation in terms of what I thought I was and what I was. There's a huge gap. And that got exposed pretty shamelessly, uh, and I would I would not forget that experience. And I just thought I'll I'll share with you uh, the key knowledge that I picked up from that that particular interaction that I had. The architecture of mind that I spoke about in terms of the conscious towards the unconscious and the kind of engrams, we can look at it in an analogy of an onion. If you look at an onion, a typical onion. There are layers, outer layers are very flimsy, easily peelable, it just vanishes, you blow it goes off. As you get inside, it gets deeper, thicker and thicker. And there is a core inside which is very thick and it cannot be peeled off, it has to be cut open. This is just an analogy, right, an upamana, right, to understand what happens to our conditioning. Now each of these layers hold engrams. Engrams that came when we are born, to which we have not done anything. That means they have just stayed as it is. Engrams that we have picked up because of conditioning and we have planted it. It just happened to plant itself there. All these are lying in different layers. And the outer layers are easy to peel. What does that mean, easy to peel? Is we call them preferences. With very small sticks, we change it. Right? They're just preferences. They are in grams that we have received, but if a situation demands me to change, I will change. And I will change for very small sticks, right? Then as you go inside, the layers are getting thicker and thicker. And if any engram is sitting in the inner layer, we call them principles, just want to, you know, want of any better words, I'm using some simple English words. Principles also, or something that we let go of, but not that easily as preferences. Uh, the stakes have to be really high if I have to let go of my principle, right? Uh, for example, I may have a principle that I don't loan any money to anybody, nor do I borrow from anybody. It can be a financial principle, right? Um, or um, uh, a trader, a stock trader may have a principle that he will not leverage beyond certain percentage. Right, so uh, it can be principles across. Principle simply means for smaller stakes we don't let go. For a very high stake, we do let go. It does that onion layer can definitely be peeled, uh, but it calls for a little more effort uh, and and little more conviction. Right, those are the inner layers, the middle layers of the onion. Um, the inner innermost layer of the onion, you can call them obsessions. You can call them values, um, non-negotiables. There are different words that are used where no matter what stake, or in fact, I may I may use the word extremely high stake only, we let go of it. Till then, we don't let go. For example, I don't kill anybody. Suppose I say I don't kill anybody. If someone says I'll give you a bribe of five lakhs, just make one murder, uh, or someone says I'll I'll give you uh, you know uh, uh, one billion dollar, you commit just one murder. Uh, there possibly are stakes at which we might break it. Uh, but it depends entirely on the context, but that's very, very difficult because it's gone so deep inside the, um, uh, the onion layer and their values and obsessions, right? Now, the beauty I realized is much of the human conflict comes because what is a principle for me can be a preference for someone else and what is a preference for someone can be a value for me, right? Um, for example, uh, in a typical Indian context, I'm a great fan of Indian culture. Uh, I'm just giving an example, so please don't uh, get attached to the example too much. Um, in, an, in a typical Indian context, the value for time, suppose we say nine o'clock, uh, coming at nine o'clock or doing something at nine o'clock. Uh, the value for time is in the outer layer of the onion because there are only more preferences for us. Um, 
it's okay for for the smallest of excuse we let go of it and we come late uh, but for an european um, it's a value uh, and the person might you know uh, not let go of it even for higher stakes right uh, during my first visit to uh, to germany it was a revelation that you know the taxi driver asked me uh, when i said that going for a meeting he asked me how fit through uh, sir when is your meeting uh, and i found that you're very intrusive question when is my meeting how, how, how should it matter this guy when is my meeting uh, but then I realized that he thinks it's his responsibility to take me on time. Uh, and so he's just trying to find out when my meeting is. Um, so the, the, the concept, more than the onion structure, is very powerful concept that we have to go is a little more deeper, where stakes determine this and the packet of emotions that we have, like the nine emotions, Navarasas, it's called. It's highly wired into this onion. Let me repeat. The nine emotions are deeply wired into this onion as an architecture, as a part of the architecture. Now, what's the meaning of emotions are wired? Let me give an example. Suppose I hold a value that timekeeping is important. It's a value. That means I don't let go of it for smaller stakes. I don't let go of it for higher stakes also. In this case, if I am late, what happens to me? If I am late, automatically, a very deep guilt is provoked in me. Emotion like a fear is provoked in me. And if someone is late, anger, another destructive emotion is provoked in me. Right? And this provocations or triggers are automatic. Right, because the emotion as a packet is hardwired into this, right? But suppose if timekeeping is only my preference, that means as long as I have a valid excuse, I come late. In this case, when I come late, I may not even feel guilty. The guilt itself is not provoked in me because it is my preference. But for someone for whom it's a principle, the guilt will be provoked, right? For example, Due to pure circumstances, I break one of my values even when nobody is watching. Let me repeat, I break one of my values even when nobody is watching. I may still feel extremely guilty about it because it is my value. It doesn't matter to me whether someone is watching or not watching. Right? Now, why am I explaining this? The reason I'm explaining this is Many, many times I am unaware of my own audience structure. What I think as my value is only a principle mm -hmm. because I seem to let go of it more number of times. Okay. What I consider as my principle, many times it's only a preference because all I need is just an excuse to let go of it. Right. Okay. This revelation was very strong in me when the, when the, saint or the guru who taught us this made a very beautiful observation. The observation is Ranga, your onion has been completely programmed by the external world. What is your contribution to programming your own onion? Right? Which means, what are the values that you have chosen for yourself? What are the principles that you have chosen for yourself? Others have programmed it. The society has programmed it. Your parents have programmed it. Everybody, everybody has programmed it. What is your contribution to it? This was a huge question that I found it difficult to handle. Right? Then I realized I need to take the life in my hands and move on with it. When I was coaching, this was a major impediment to me. What's the meaning of impediment? My value system interfered when I was coaching somebody. Right? For example, if I attach a lot of value to being in India and contributing to India, when a person sat in front of me for, for counseling, had some options of traveling abroad and another option of staying back in India, even if I was only asking him questions, but the direction of my questioning was only towards guiding him towards making that choice because my inner onion layers were interfering in judging what is possibly correct for the other person and what is correct for the other person may be completely different from how my onion is structured.
or maybe the other person is sitting with a structure of onion, which is completely different, right? My, my value systems were interfering deeply with, with other person, right? Now, I, I have my uh, you know, colleague, uh, Sri Vidya, of course, I would small change Sri Vidya with your permission. Uh, you could possibly share it at the end of my presentation, if that's okay with you, uh, rather than do it now, right? Uh, it's a small change from what we discussed, right? She has a very powerful example for what happened when, when her value systems interfere, right? But for example, if I think that no matter what, your good marriage is where your person continues with all the problems. If that is my deep conditioning that I've received through my life, and if a person is coming and sitting in front of me for life coaching, I'm getting abused every day in the house, in the family. I may not suggest to that person to exit the wedding, exit the marriage, sorry. Right? Because my value system will interfere there. So I think we have very deep understanding of ourselves in terms of how we are made. Right? Is very important because we have a very, very large responsibility as a coach, as a life coach, to, uh, to guide the other person very correctly, relevant to his or her context may not be relevant to our context, right? I think it's important, right? Now, during the session, when I'm sitting for a coaching session with somebody, during the session, it's all temperament and skills. That's all. Um, skills, like in terms of what question to ask, how to word it, what tone to use, what body language, should I be sitting in front of the chair? Should I be sitting behind? Should I be sitting by the side of the coachy, Or should I be sitting opposite? Should there be a table in front of me? Or all this is all skill, body language, right? Should I interrupt? How much should I listen? Should I make physical contact to the coachy? When should I touch the person? When should I not touch the person? All these are skills. We learn it. In all our coaching sessions and trainings and so on, we learn all this, right? This is during the session. But beyond the coaching session, I think it is who we are. Right? It is not even who we think we are. It's not even what others think we are. Because we, we, we are all damn good in creating a huge facade, a perception, making sure that the rest of the world perceives us correctly, right? Or in a particular way, yeah? So it's not about what others think we are. It's not about who we think we are. It's who, who we are. I think it is beyond the session. It is ultimately who we are, right? The identity. Uh, in a very beautiful book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, James Clear, the author, says that very nicely, don't alter your behaviors alter your identity, right? For example, if, if you want to get fit, right? Don't change your behavior of just wearing your shoes and going for a jogging. No, that's not going to help you. Change your identity. Maybe your identity is you can never be fit. And until that identity changes, an alteration of behavior won't change, right? So I think during the session, it's temperament and skills. And beyond the session, it's who we are, right? Now, when we are with a coachy, how soon can we make a connection and how long can the connection be independent of how often we meet? Let me repeat. When I'm in a coaching interaction with somebody, how early can I make a connection to that person? How deep and long can that connection be independent of the number of sessions or the frequency with which I meet that person? To a large extent, it is not about just impressing the other person. It's about inspiring the other person. And how can this happen? There are times when, you know, uh, even before any meaningful coaching has started, uh, my experience is the person has said that, uh, uh, Ranga, I don't think it will work. I'm sorry. Uh, I would like to exit this coaching. It has also happened to me that even before any meaningful progress has happened in the coaching, the person said, Ranga, I, I, I don't think I require inputs from you, but I think I've got what I wanted. Uh, I think it's been a phenomenal experience, Ranga, interacting with you. This has also happened to me. I have both the extremes as examples, right? So which means there are some factors which seem to be working, which are beyond skills because across the table, it's just skills, right? Um, so what is what are those factors? 
So what are these factors which are beyond skills? Okay. Coaching is about helping an individual take objective, rational, intellect-based changes and decisions for an issue that a person is facing, right? If a, if a corporate CEO is facing scaling issues, if a school student is facing career challenges, if a normal person is facing, say, a, a life challenge, a regular day-to-day -day life challenge, right? We expect the person to take a decision based on intellect, based on IQ, not based on emotions. But we have an emotional quotient or a feelings quotient. I don't want to delve into the details of what is, how is a feeling different from emotions in this session. So I have given equal importance to feelings quotient and emotion quotient, though I give a little higher weightage to feelings quotient. The way feelings quotient and emotion quotient works is it acts as a door to IQ. That means if a person is not feeling good, his IQ will not work. Right? For example, a person is highly emotionally disturbed coming and sitting in front of you. Until we handle the emotion, any logical solution we give or any logical direction we take the person will not work because the IQ door is closed. IQ door is closed because the domination is on the feelings or the emotion portion. So until that emotion and feelings is handled well, the IQ door won't open. So the emotional quotient acts as a door to the IQ. But is it all? No. I am not here talking about this because all of you would know about emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, Daniel Golden, all these concepts you're all very, very familiar. What I learned was one step beyond this. Just like how EQ opens the door for IQ, the spiritual quotient opens the door for the correct feelings. And here spirituality has nothing to do with religion at all. Right? Spiritual quotient has is nothing to do with religion. It can be anything. Religion is just one way of life. That's it. There are different ways of life. Right? Um, the spiritual quotient or the spiritual intelligence of a person creates a kind of an aura that creates that early and deep connect that I'm talking about. Right? And all this happens at a subconscious level. Today, executive presence is a huge topic. People talk about how to create a, create a presence. In fact, I conduct a one or two-day workshops on executive presence. Okay, how do you how do you have a stage presence when you stand stand on a stage uh, and a thousand people there? What is stage presence? Does it have anything to do with your height, weight, and the kind of dress you wear, or it's something else? Right? What is this executive presence all about? What I realized was the spiritual quotients or the spiritual intelligence creates a kind of an energy and that energy affects the feelings, not just of ourselves, but also of the other person. I'm going to give a small example here uh, and I'm not bringing religion and please don't think I'm bringing religion here. Um, a very divine, very divine personality, somebody who, I'm giving this example because someone who's, who lived just a couple of thousand years ago with us, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, I am standing in a queue and somebody just knocks my elbow and goes away and it's paining and that person turns and says, hey, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this, I'm sorry about this. Whatever be the pain, I tell him it's all right, don't bother and I go, I, I withstand the pain and I forgive the person. Suppose a person knocks me and it pains and the guy goes without turning and saying sorry. And I call the guy, hello. And the guy says, yes. I tell him, you knocked me. And he says, so. Question is, can I forgive the person? It's very difficult. Right? I am able to forgive the person. It's not about my ability. Because I can forgive the person if he says sorry. So it's not about an ability. It's a stand. Right? Ego is operational here. He is not even said a sorry. He's not even feeling sorry. Why should I forgive the person? Now here an argument or a fight might come out. This is an ordinary human being like me. Imagine Jesus Christ. He was put on the cross. Nails were driven on his hands, on his forehead, on his knees. And the cross was lifted up vertically. 
when the cross was lifted up vertically the body gravity will pull the body gravity will not know here is a man in pain i cannot pull his body gravity works it's natural law right it's a divine law and imagine the points where the nails have gone in and when the body is pulled excruciating pain right i don't think you and i can connect to that pain but in that state of pain if that divine mind can think oh lord please forgive these people they know not what they are doing the correct kind of feeling that his mind has generated is compassion and forgiveness and that feeling has come from a very very high level of attuned spiritual intelligence right i'm just giving a relevant example please i'm not bringing religion this is possible for you and me right I mean, that's what our scriptures say what uh, uh, rudra or shiva has reached in 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 hindu scriptures you and i can reach it's the difference is only sadhana the difference is only practice right so can i elevate my spiritual intelligence to such an extent that even before somebody shares something with me when i am sitting as a coach there is a deep connect that is already established and i am able to bring a value which is far higher right and this can happen through the third layer which is spiritual coaction and spiritual coaching opens a door for emotional coaching and feelings coaching and feelings coaching opens a door for iq and at the end of it it is our heightened intellect that should function and intellect unfortunately doesn't function when we are crowded with emotions and feelings and our emotions and feelings are not appropriate emotions and feeling at higher frequency when our spiritual intelligence is very less when we are on a given take when we are on a settle the scores right when we are on a masking kind of situation where we are not authentic we are a different person outside the coaching room and inside the coaching room we project a completely different personality of ourselves right when such authenticity is missing i think the spiritual coaching gets affected and the deep and long connection is not possible right that's what i realized now the kind of an alignment that we can have between our thoughts words and deeds can build the spiritual energy in us like we say something right and we think about it and our actions also kind of align with with that right and when these three are aligned beautifully right i've seen frankly no offense meant i've seen coaches in fact uh, i don't want to name uh, i see of trained coaches right but some of them who uh, discuss the the coaches issues with other people outside and they talk so low about the person and i i i carry no respect for such coaches because first of all what happens inside a coaching room cannot be shared outside and that too you in front of him you tell him you're a genius and back side you tell him he's an he's an idiot not okay so i think somewhere the our own alignment of thought we thoughts words and deeds uh, becomes a kind of a very important uh, spiritual energy and that in turn affects the energy space around us right we all have space in fact i read a very very powerful quotation which said people go in search of spaces to get energized people go in search of spaces to get energized there are some people who energize the space they are in why right? and that happens by being extremely authentic and when that space gets energized automatically that in turn affects the thought words and deeds of the person who is sitting in front of us and then it works as a cycle right and the effectiveness of our coaching is taken to a totally different plane altogether the trust the faith that the person can have on us can be at a totally different plane right now some attributes of spiritual coaching just quickly running through seeing everything as a whole that means uh, when when a left hand is hurt by let's assume i i close the door of the car and my little finger gets stuck in the car and it pains it hurts uh, right um it's a left hand that is hurt by the right hand because the right hand don't close the door the right hand closed the door left hand got hurt the left hand doesn't carry any negativities towards the right hand right next time when the right hand is pain it's a left hand that goes automatically to help the reason it is happening is because the left hand and right hand belong to the same body can i connect to the whole universe as like that 
And the moment I can connect to the whole universe, what happens is my empathy, the level of empathy increases, the level of compassion increases, and the way I coach becomes very, very different. Right? So seeing everything as a whole. Second, commitment to a larger purpose. For example, why am I coaching? Why am I mentoring somebody? For what? There's a larger purpose, connecting to the larger purpose. For example, we all know about Helen Keller. Helen Keller transformed the world of all the blind people. But who transformed Helen Keller's world? There was a teacher. And that teacher transformed the world only for one person. That's Helen Keller. The teacher did not focus on others. She transformed the life of Helen Keller. And Helen Keller transformed the lives of everybody because the purpose which the teacher had was much, much larger. I am coaching somebody. I am mentoring somebody. Yes, I have an invoice to raise at the end of it. And that person has to pay me certain money. All that is transactions. But beyond that, we need to ask a question. Why am I truly growing others? Why am I contributing to others? I think we should have a much larger vision, larger purpose. Through that person, a lot of things can happen. Right? So commitment to a larger purpose becomes very, very vital. For example, why am I doing this session twice a year? I'm not being paid for this session. Right? Yeah. Why am I doing this? Is it just to impress you? Is it just to uh, make some of you say, hey, Ranga, it was a great session? No, it's a much larger because I know I am dealing with people. Each of you can impact the lives of so many people. And if I, if I cause even the smallest, smallest influence on you today, I think the impact of that is much larger to the whole world. And that's what I'm looking at, right? So... Commitment to a larger purpose. Third, authenticity. Right? Authenticity is different from sincerity. Yeah? Being authentic to oneself, being authentic to the cause. Right? There are, there are times when we need to be harsh with the kochi. We can't always, you know, uh, treat the kochi with, uh, with uh, a child's gloves. No, it's not possible. Right? So being authentic in terms of the output, in terms of the purpose, and more importantly, self-governed actions, what are called non-negotiables. We programming our own onion. It doesn't matter how the rest of the world is. It doesn't matter how the other coaches are. What is the general good practice of all coaches? doesn't matter to me. I am a coach. I am here to influence lives of people. And I need to take a call what my non-negotiables are. I need to take a call what I want to be outside of the coaching room. Rather, I want to be what I want to be when nobody is watching me. What is my fabric? What is my character? Self-governed actions. It's not actions as defined by the society. It's not actions as defined by the law, the legal state. What are my values? What are my non-negotiables? Right? And of course, last but not least, higher responsibility and wider contribution. Okay, it's not a transaction. As somebody said, John, you know, Jim, uh, Jim Collins, who wrote a beautiful book called Good to Great, how oh, only some companies, good companies, become great companies. He said very nicely, there is no work. There is no work at all. There's only responsibility. Your guy who's flying a plane doesn't have a work to do. He has a responsibility of 300, 400 people's lives. There is no work. There is only responsibility. Their coaching is not a work. It's not a transaction to be completed. It's, it's, it's a responsibility. Understanding that it's a responsibility and a wider contribution. Cooking is not work. Cooking is responsibility for the health of the people at home. Right? Now, these are some very key attributes of spiritual quotient, which I thought I would just share with you. Right? Um, I don't want to get into understanding this, uh, uh, talk about the shloka and, and the meaning. Right? I just want to conclude uh, because I've practiced this session to be for exactly one hour. Um, so uh, we started at 6.35 and so I have time for another eight, nine minutes. Right? I've run this session a couple of times in my mind to be sure that I'm on time. Uh, the crux of this shloka from Bhagavad Gita is very simple. Concentrate on the duty, what needs to be done, right? And let us not get attached to the output. Let's not get attached to the success or the failure because there are factors which are far beyond us that can cause that success or failure. Right? Right? I think 
the crux of this shloka is samatvam yoga vuchade samatvam is an equanimity your mind which is calm your, your mind that is not affected too much by success a mind that is not affected too much by failure your mind that is having equanimity is a mind that's essential right and i found this a huge challenge to develop this kind of mind because there were too many factors which were causing turbulence like if i suggest something to the coach and the coach is coach is not implemented i get annoyed i used to get annoyed why is he not implement i told him and suddenly i realized that my own temperament is coming into picture what is a temperament coming into picture my own rajasvik tendency rajasvik means i'm passion driven action driven result driven that tendency is coming sudden awareness that that tendency is coming into me that awareness helps me to immediately handle the next coaching session very differently and this is where the self knowledge comes in extremely handy right so um another great benefit of um, i have seven minutes left another great benefit of uh, self knowledge which i found uh, there are many benefits i'm just sharing two of them here one is the spiritual portion part and the second one is um we all operate at different frequencies our mind we remember we talked about the mind only right our mind operates can operate at completely different frequencies there's a book written by uh, you know i i i forget the author name sorry just slip my mind suddenly very popular book called power versus force in that book the author beautifully categorized all emotions into a pyramid of frequencies he is a physicist right he is a research scholar he has organized all the emotions and frequencies and he talks about how our mind is capable of vibrating at completely different frequencies right now dr charles towns uh, who won the nobel prize for uh, laser and maser beams has written this says it came to me as a sudden revelation when i was totally relaxed i knew the conclusion not the spe- steps later i had to work the steps to present it to the public it took him two years what does it mean it came to me what is that it that it is nothing but the truth the truth of the laser and maser beams it has happened to archimedes when he was taking a bath the revelation came to him right so it came to me as a sudden revelation when my mind was totally relaxed that means my mind was in a state which is very calm i figured out something the truth hit me hard but the world won't accept the truth unless i present it to them intellectually and that took me two years he says right now our mind can operate at completely different frequencies three frequencies i'd like to speak to you about today before i close we all hold past knowledge when i say past it's across time that's all what i gained at the age of 5 i remember at the age of 50 certain things certain things i don't remember even though it happened just one minute back like uh, otp that i uh, that i typed into my uh, you know mobile one minute back and i got something clear i don't remember the otp right so there are certain things that i remember for a long time right and that time can happen even across your births is our scriptures say because our scriptures doesn't identify birth and death at all our scriptures only identify time as a continuum and these are events like any other event birth and death are also events on that continuum that's all so uh, past knowledge we access instantly and that is what we call subconscious like i have a fear of dog because i got bitten by a dog when i was young and i remember the multiple injections that i had to take so there is an engram in my mind engraved memory in my mind about a dog and that i that fear i carry for 40 years 50 years and i meet a pet dog that's extremely friendly no i get that access to that knowledge immediately instantly and that comes from subconscious mind and that we call as instinct right then you listen to something today you read a book you attend a seminar why right? you go through an introspection in your mind you get new knowledge and that new knowledge is got out of analysis and logic and that takes time right you take one year to analyze something and understand 
I take five years to analyze the same thing and understand. Right. So analysis and logic takes time to understand. And in the end of it, I get a new knowledge which I never knew. Right. And that happens at conscious mind. The second layer of the mind, the conscious mind. And that's what we call intellect. So intellect, we use our intellect to understand things that we don't know. And we know. And that takes time. Instinct is past knowledge, accessed instantly. Intellect is new knowledge, taking time. The third category is a combination of these two, which is new knowledge accessed instantly. That means no logic, no analysis. Like what Charles Towns said, the truth hit me in an instant. Right. And the analysis followed later using intellect. But the truth itself hit him instantly. And that frequency, intellect is a higher frequency to instinct. And the third frequency, which is super conscious, is a much higher frequency to conscious, which in turn is a higher frequency to subconscious. The super conscious, where new knowledge is accessed instantly is what we call intuition. Now, one of the biggest benefits of self-knowledge that I've gained is you get into certain domains of understanding which strikes you at that moment when you're sitting on the coaching table. Right? It's not something that you've read in a book. Right? The coachee is sharing something. And you instantly tell something to that person. It can be an example you give. It can be an analogy you give. It is a question that you ask. But that question is not come out of your skills. It's not coming out of your instinct. It is not coming out of your intellect. It is just striking you at that time. And that has proved to be a great input to that person. I have found a lot of delving into self-knowledge, a lot of meditations, a lot of calmness of the mind tunes our mind to a higher frequency. And when it tunes our mind to a higher frequency, there are many, many things that we end up seeing, which, which are just at that time. It surprises the coachy and it surprises you as much because even you never knew this, right? It's a new knowledge that hits you instantly, right? So these are two very deep benefits, right? Um, of course, the mentee goes through a problem of helplessness because of which he or she comes to you, which is recognition of a problem and helplessness, which is what are. Then there is an acceptance of helpless, helplessness, which makes the person seek out to coaching. And last, the coachee or the mentee surrenders to you to say, look, please guide me. Right. And this is exactly what Arjuna faced in the battlefield with Krishna. He realized he was completely helpless and he accepted that he was helpless and he surrendered. And then the coaching started, right, through 18 chapters. Now, my question, what I have learned here is, it is equally applicable to the mentor as much as it is applicable to the mentee. Means what? There are times in my coaching sessions, I have found I am completely helpless. I don't know what to tell that person. Right? Because all that I've read, all that I've learned, all that I've been trained on is not helping me. But that person is looking up to me and I'm lost. And I have an image to protect as a coach. Right? Because at the end of it, I'm going to raise an invoice and he needs to pay me. All that is transactions. But the fact is I'm helpless. Here, again, I think the self-knowledge helps you to say it's perfectly okay to be helpless. <laughs> it's perfectly okay to be helpless. All it calls for is an acceptance of the fact that we're helpless. And just as the coach has surrendered, we also need to surrender to the divine power. And when we surrender to the divine power, we definitely get help. So this RAS, which is recognition of helplessness, A, which is acceptance of helplessness, and yes, which is surrender, is applicable both to the mentee 
and two dimensional in equal proportion, right? So this is in short, what I wanted to talk to you about. I know I've taken a few minutes extra from my plan, um, right? So that is another uh, wonderful shloka about Karpanya Dosha. The Karpanya Dosha is a very, very powerful concept uh, which, which requires at least a day to discover and understand, right? Here it says, look, I am confused. That's it. There's nothing wrong in saying that it doesn't, it doesn't make us small. Uh, it doesn't reduce us. If you are confused, you're confused. That's it. I, if I need help, I need help. That's it. Right. So because it's a human mind, it can go through various layers of confusion and clarity at different times. Right. So seeking help does not make me small in any way. Right. So with this, I would like to share with you. We are a group of people who who run a group called Joyful Vedanta, because if Vedanta or any scripture for that matter uh, is not going to help me in being joyful and peaceful, uh, that's just theory and philosophy. It's not going to help me at all. Right? So we have created a group called Joyful Vedanta, uh, and um, we are um, not specifically focused on any specific religion. What we are actually talking about is logic. What we are talking about is trying to present everything in a logical and scientific way so that it can appeal to a human intellect. That's our focus. We have lots of free videos. Uh, I request each of you to you know, uh, visit our YouTube channel at Joyful Vedanta. Of course, all our social media handles are at Joyful Vedanta, Instagram, uh, Facebook page, LinkedIn page. Everything is Joyful Vedanta. Uh, there are lots of lots of free videos which we have given, uh, which is helping an individual in different ways. Of course, you could visit our joyfulvedanta.org website uh, and press the courses button. There are different courses we have. For example, I, I have a course on understand yourself. Okay, 14 sessions of 90 minutes each, uh, yeah. live sessions converted to uh, you know uh, recorded sessions. Nine, 15, almost 15 sessions of 90 minutes each, just to understand oneself in terms of body and mind. Um, uh, we are currently running a course on self growth because we are not knowing ourselves for anything. We need to grow and we need to help others grow also. That's our role. So what is self-growth? We are currently running a session in which four episodes have already gone. We have another 12 episodes, at least uh, 10 episodes, which are ready to happen. So join us and explore yourself, explore ourselves. Uh, it's, it's a never-ending journey. One life is not enough. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, we need to be on the school at all times. So uh, I'm extremely, extremely grateful to you know Tejasvi and uh, uh, Shanti for giving me this opportunity, for thinking of me uh, and considering me worthy enough to, to spend time with a group of experts like you. Uh, and, and it's a great honor. So thanks is a very small word, uh, Tejasvi and uh, uh, Shanti. Tejasvi has been part of our Joyful Vedanta journey uh, for the last one year. And she is an ICF coach and she has immensely benefited. And she is the one who suggested that uh, I share my perspectives with you. All I have shared is only perspectives. It is small learnings that I've had. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our paths will cross again. Uh, and I will be very happy to interact with any of you. So with this, I would like to close with, once again, uh, deep, deep, deep gratitude to my gurus, uh, without whom I would be nothing. With my prayers to my gurus. I would like to conclude this session with million thanks to each of you for investing your time and listening to my perspectives. May the divine give you everything in abundance. Thank you, Antranams. Thank you so much, Ranga. There are so many wonderful comments in the text chat that you can already see. Uh, I, join, I know Johnny has posted a question but anyone else, Johnny, you can go first. And then after that, anyone who has questions, please raise your hands and then we'll go in the sequence in which you're raising your hands. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, Ranga, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Pranams, to such a wonderful, um, divinely provoked session. I'm, I'm saying that there is definitely an intervention of divine uh, through your voice, uh, which I heard. So thank you. Uh, I just had a very simple question. Is um, the values, and you had said it, a, a, you know, stroke, obsession, are they the same? Or if they are different, how are they different? Yeah, uh, they are different. Um, the reason why I put it there is because uh, sometimes our obsessions function exactly the same way as values. That means they become non-negotiable, 
We don't let go of it even for high stakes. We don't realize what we are losing in the process. We just do it. It can be addictions, right? It need not be only uh, uh, drugs. There are many, many things that each person is addicted to. Like for some people, it's WhatsApp. For some people, it is music. For some people, it's a hobby, right? Uh, and we don't realize. We, we behave exactly like it is values. So that's the reason I chose to keep it there, though they are different. From a behavioral angle, they, the, the outwardly manifestations may look the same. That's why I put it there, but they are different. Thanks for bringing this up. Um, Ranga, people are reminding us uh, that Srividya was supposed to share an experience. Yes, yes, please, Srividya, I request you to. Thank you. Sorry, Srividya, for the sudden shift. I just didn't want the flow to break. Sorry. Absolutely okay, Ranga. It has to be in the flow. That is what is most important for all of us. I'm not sure if I need to share with all this. Such a great session. Uh, but now the reminder has come. I have no choice. But Can you spotlight Srividya, please? Srividya, continue speaking. I can't see where you are. Uh, right okay, I've done it. No worries. Uh, thank you, Shanti. Thank you, Tejasvi and Ranga. What happened to me when I had a situation which was extremely against our, any of our value system, uh, not just me, I'm sure it's for all of us. So one of the person whom I am supposed to help uh, walked in and said, uh, why have you come here? Suddenly popped up after three years of a gap where the intervention was happened earlier and the person was okay. He walked in and said, uh, what happened when I asked my wife delivered a baby girl? Naturally, any of us would instantly say, wow, congratulations, etc. But uh, this is where, you know, I looked up him. He looked very shattered. So I did, though the congratulations came till here, but I didn't put it out and said, you look very shattered. He said, yes, I'm not happy. And this was against as is as it is against my value. But added to this, he says, "No, I always wanted a boy baby, but I've you know my wife is delivered a girl baby. I'm extremely disappointed, and I'm unhappy to the extent he said he was ready to kill that three days young baby. Natural me against value system was like you know burning inside, ready to." slap, ready to do whatever. I mean, I'm sure, right? It's not something we can take it saying somebody can kill a baby. But thanks to the learnings saying everyone has a context. So I had to take a pause for myself for a minute, gather my own self and said, okay. And then said, what exactly is the issue? Then, then the session continued. He had totally a different context and you know, cut the long story short. He later changed himself by just me asking few questions and nothing else. And now they're happy father and daughter and all that. I think this is what helps us uh, from the Vedanta in these extreme uh, cases where people tell you something against. How can we still stay balanced uh, is what Ranga was sharing and yet help the person who's sitting next to you. Uh, I just wanted to share this uh, extreme uh, example. Well, I have many, but I want to just keep it to one in the interest of time because people might have questions. If nobody has a question as planned, I have another example to share, but let's wait for the questions. Yes, Vikas, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. Uh, gratitude for Ranga and uh, Sri Vidya for sharing this. Uh, I think this is extremely powerful. It gives a very strong insight to what Ranga tried to share, you know. Uh, for me, this is a new experience, I would say. And thank you so much for this. I want to ask uh, Ranga that, you know, with your experience, if I and just, you know, I don't know why this question comes to my mind that who is the divine god of coaching in Indian mythology? Could you place somebody? <laughs> I know you're going to laugh. <laughs> interesting, interesting, really interesting. Um, 
maybe Srividi can also answer this question because she has actually put together a beautiful course uh, on what are the different mentoring and coaching uh, methods and strategies as given in our scriptures. We have put together a course. Okay. Okay. Um, it is a very ancient subject. It's uh, uh, okay. you know, a very gurukulam. Uh, actually, was primarily a coach. And uh, any kind of an interaction, if you if you ask uh, entire Upanishad, is only question answer, question answer, question answer, and it's uh, nowhere questions are stopped, right? And uh, so much questions are encouraged, and there is no age. For example, we have a Katopanishad where a small boy goes to Yama and asks questions about birth and death. And uh, you know, with great respect, the answers are given. Um, so I think if you look at our entire Upanishad, almost everybody has been a coach. Okay. Right? And um, there are great texts about Tarka, which was a Sastra, about Tarka is debate, it is not argument, where clear guidelines are given as to how to discuss a subject without focusing on the person and focus on the issue. And what are the guidelines by which you can make sure that you seek the truth in a discussion rather than prove either one person to be right or wrong. And there are clear 2022 guidelines given as to uh, what we should follow. Right Now, all this has existed years ago, thousands of years ago, but somewhere in our schooling system, everything is lost. Uh, and today we are in a world where we say India wants to know. So, uh, you know, <laughs> right? so I think somewhere down the line, um, uh, all this is lost, but everybody is a coach. Uh, in fact, even if you look at Bhagavad Gita, the Krishna, uh, until Arjuna expresses his helplessness and surrenders, Krishna doesn't speak. And the beauty, beauty of our coaching is after 17 chapters of explaining patiently all the questions raised by Arjuna, in the 18th chapter, Askuna asks a very beautiful question. Okay, tell me what I should do. <laughs> <laughs> gives it back to him. Okay. Yeah. And that's when Krishna says, I have told you whatever I need to do, whatever you need to do, it's up to you now. That's the beauty of our thing that we always give the choice to the other person because the decision has to come from that person. We are not here to give solutions or decisions to the other person. Right? It's up to you. So I think almost everybody who's uh, Upanishad uh, uh, writer uh, has been a coach. Uh, we have a Yajnavakya Smriti where the second wife of Yajnavakya, um, to whom he hands over all his wealth and goes up, she questions him as to if you are seek, if you are leaving all the wealth and going, that means you are seeking something more valuable. What is that? <laughs> and then there is a huge discussion between her and uh, Yajnavakya, which has come as an Upanishad. It's called Maitri Upanishad. So I think I think everywhere it's 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 okay. only coach, 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 and nobody else. Thank you so much. I think, uh, you know, yeah. uh, I get a feeling of this, you know, I always wonder why India has not got world-class coaches, you know, where, uh, you know, we can feel that, okay, we have, we are taking the coaching world to a next level. I think today we are all set to get into this whole thing. Thank you yes, so much. Please do. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So much. I yeah. think one of the, one of the objectives I had was uh, we lost all those and I think we need to put it back and we can be a group who starts it all again, right? Absolutely. We can take the coaching to a completely different plane. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks, Vikas. Tejasvi, first of all, thank you for getting us connected to Ranga. The session has been phenomenal. Please proceed to ask your question. Yeah. I have something to share and also a question, Ranga. Thank you once again for sharing your time so generously and your knowledge. Um, what I had to share was, you know, um, until uh, I must first thank Suresh Ranganathan for introducing me to Joyful Ranga. He's also a coach uh, and he's here with us. Uh, until last year, you know, my approach was read, read, read as many books as you can, you know, assimilate the knowledge. So um, one of my record reading sprints was reading 25 books in six months. Uh, I felt superb about it. You know, it was like an accomplishment, but nothing about me had changed. It had not made any dent in who I was or in my attitude and my personality. But uh, since January, I have been part of uh, the Joyful Vedanta group. And what has changed for me is what I'm learning. I'm also um, implementing it. I'm also debating it, discussing it with my peers. And I'm seeing, you know, a practical change. Uh, in my sadhana, you know, as I call it. So I pick an idea from Ranga's lectures and then 
I play with it and then I make some changes in my life and form a habit. So that has been very consistent and I see a huge growth in myself uh, in the last eight, nine months. And it's more than what my coaches de derive from it. I feel I'm changed as a person and that's why I felt the need to share this with other coaches um, today with the ICF uh, as we can all benefit from it. So that was my sharing and thank you so much Ranga and Sri Vidya and Shanti for making this happen. Thank you. Uh, my question to you Ranga was, um, you spoke about spiritual quotient and any sadhana or action that you would like to share uh, that will help us increase that spiritual quotient. Okay, brilliant. Uh, there are many sadhanas. Um, so I don't want to stretch this session to tomorrow morning. Uh, so I will possibly share just one sadhana. The first attribute of divinity, any divinity, the first attribute of divinity is non-discrimination. Okay. Um, every law, physics law, chemical law, biological law, any law is divinity. That's what we call it as orders, right? If you recall what we saw in the season two, where we talked about 15 lectures of self-knowledge. Uh, the first thing we saw is divinity is set of laws. Gravity does not differentiate. Gravity does not discriminate. For everybody, it is same 9.8 meters per second square and it will work all the time. Right? So if you want to scale yourself from a human plane to a divine plane, if you want to scale yourself from an intellect frequency to an intuitive frequency, I think a sadhana is Minimize your, uh, you know, discriminations. Differencing is okay. For example, uh, your, your junior manager will get a lesser salary than a senior manager. This is not discrimination. This is difference in the structure itself. Right? A person who is performing at one level will get one kind of reward. A person performing at a higher level will get another kind of reward. This is not discrimination. This is a difference as part of the system. Just like how a man and woman are different as part of the system. There is no discrimination there. But within the boundary of the system, discrimination is human created, which comes out of biases. Right? Which comes out of my preferences to certain people who are like me. <laughs> right? I think the sadhana that we can apply is, the first sadhana is, I would call it, minimize your discrimination by enhancing your objectivity. Right. So what I would recommend is, uh, I don't know where you're based. You're based in Bangalore? Where are you based? Yeah? Bangalore. Yeah. So if you're based in Bangalore, either you can drop in my house or uh, you can send me your address and I will courier a book to you. The book is called The Yoga of Objectivity. Wow. Thank you so okay. much. So that book details everything about how it is so difficult to become objective because we are simply human. Right. So that's the first sadhana that I would recommend. Is this book available on Amazon also? Sorry. I am not sure. I have not checked, but I have about 200 copies of the book. Anybody who is interested, please write to me. I can send it across. You can either write to Ranga or to me because I've sent you also the contact. So yeah. you can write to sure. one of us and we will help you. Thank you so um, maybe on the chat box, can you share our email IDs, uh, Shrividya? I will. Uh, my email ID is a little easy to remember. It is joyfulranga at gmail.com. Okay. So, <laughs> And now that we are uh, spotlighted together, Tejasvi, let me take this occasion to thank you personally for giving me this opportunity and to Shanti too. Yeah. Equally grateful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, may, may, may I ask a question? Uh, it's a small clarification. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ranga for an inspiring uh, session. And uh, when talking about the attributes of spiritual quotient, we talked about self-governed actions. And those are where you don't follow, you don't necessarily follow others, but you yourself uh, think and know and take actions that uh, are, are required. Now there, uh, the actions will of course be subject to some constraints like uh, not violating other people's rights or not violating the law of the land, something like that. So they won't be totally self-governed actions then. Okay. Uh, 
there is a law of land and there is a certain set of guidelines to which we fall into place. Self-governed actions will be a commitment to follow those. Right? Mm -hmm. For example, if there's a traffic light, even if I am at midnight and if there is a red light and if there are no vehicles anywhere, I can mm -hmm. still go, but I still choose not to go is a self-governed action. Is it fine? Okay. Yeah. That means my, my decision to adhere to certain boundaries, which are essential for me, right? And that becomes a self-governed action. You are perfectly right. Um, self-governed action is not about... Um, are doing whatever you feel like because you're convinced about it, it has to be within the boundary. 100%. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. An explicit request to each of you, please visit our YouTube channel, watch all the videos and do follow and subscribe. Uh, we have taken a decision to go only, grow only organically and not through any other automated means to get suddenly 1 lakh subscribers and we don't want to do that because we think it's ethically wrong. Uh, so we want to grow slowly. We want to grow with genuine subscribers. So I would be happy if each of you can become a genuine subscriber. Thank you. While we are waiting for the next set of questions, Ranga, just to okay. mention to the chapter members that uh, the, up, the links to register for the upcoming sessions, the November sessions, I've posted it into the text chat. Uh, please do register. And we can continue with any questions we may have for Ranga. Ranga, Suresh has even looked up the book and he's put the link yeah. in the... Thanks, Suresh. Thank you. So we have the, a... best, uh, the best part of uh, Joyful Vedanta learners is uh, each person is a contributor. So they don't wait for any prompt. They don't wait for anything. They just, just keep sharing. <laughs> they just keep giving. So thanks, Suresh. Ranga, I also want to say that we are not a cult, right? Yes, we are not a cult. Absolutely. Uh, uh, it is not centered around me. It is not centered around anybody. We are a group of people who are driven by a vision. Uh, and the vision takes precedent, not anybody. So, thanks, Kala. Thank you. If no one has any further yeah, questions, sure. Ranga, Sri Vidya, I think I would like Thank to... You. So once again, profusely, because the session has been very valuable. I can sense it through the messages I'm getting in the text chat and my phone is already flooding with the thank you messages. So yes. humbled, uh, I will pass on as many as I can. Please, uh, please share, uh, share what people have shared with you to us. So it will be helpy. Thank you. And uh, uh, Namaskaram. So I'm wishing yes. each of you an amazing life ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, people. Have a great evening. Looking forward to meeting you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Shanti. Thank you, Ranga. Thanks, Shanti. Thanks, everyone. Bye.